MCC TV is largely about what happens in the classrooms here at Metropolitan Community College. We also present interviews with speakers, authors, and performers who visit our campuses. And of course, once per quarter, we sit down with the president and CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce for a chat about the economic health and development of our viewing area. The conversation just ahead is about what happened in quarter number three of 2020 and how we fared so far through the COVID epidemic. I'm your host, Kent Pavelka, and David Brown joins us next on MCC TV. Welcome everybody and uh, welcome back to you, David. It's, uh, it's been three months since we have uh, had this chat and I guess we'll just dive right in uh, with maybe your analysis of 2020 to date and uh, how the pandemic has affected us here in the greater Omaha area. This is gonna challenge your, your glasses half full. Of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure we have enough time to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on. Yeah and Omaha, et cetera. But, you know, you, you got to be a good friend of mine is always looking for the silver lining. And um, I tell her that's kind of what I do for a living. But in, in, in large measure, though, you got to be impressed with um, how despite everything that's happened this year, you know, people have continued to move forward, have continued to try and lead their lives, continue to uh, worry about their families and their friends and their coworkers and their employees and we continue to see good things happen here in town. So I'm, I know that's, that's a little bit Pollyanna, but like I say, I get paid to be an optimist and my, my, my natural inclination is to try and figure out where the good stuff's going on and see if we can get more of it. So I think there's been some clear impacts that we talked about last time. I mean, clearly uh, the conference convention space has been impacted uh, negatively in this market. I mean, there's all we have to do is look at what didn't occur last spring um, from the mm -hmm. Berkshire Hathaway event and then all the conventions that were planned moving forward. And you know there's going to be an impact on, on, on the industries that depend upon business travelers and convention travelers and the restaurants, bars, event spaces that depend upon um, events happening in the community. So We've also seen lots of events not happen, you know, whether it be sporting events, two, three or four big sporting events. But then since then, we've actually seen, well, Big Ten football is playing. And, you know, there's, there's going to be a volleyball Final Four still here. It's going to be six months later than what we had planned, but it's going to be here nonetheless. And I think that's the part that's been most impressive is once we've figured out what we can and cannot do, you know, we have figured out a way to do as much of what we want to do as we can and still be safe. So whether it's um, businesses coming back to work or employees learn how to live and work remotely, you know, people like us talking to each other in a, through a video screen that we never would have dreamed of a year ago. I yeah. mean, people have learned how to run their businesses, run their lives, manage themselves, not without any kind of a hiccup, but nonetheless, it's impressive to see the resiliency of people in this community and around the country. Well, you, you characterize it as a, as a hiccup. It's been kind of a, a large hiccup. Um, how, how do you quantify what this has done to us? Let's t just in economic terms, or can we? Yeah, I think we can. I think if, if you look at the, um, some of the statistics, so um, at the worst of it back in the spring, I think there were 60,000 people had filed for unemployment in the state. 60,000 people. I mean, and actually I was in this region, 60,000 people. And if, if you look at what a normal is, if there is such a thing as normal, we'd be around, you know, 3% unemployment, something like that. Well, if you got a labor force of 500,000 people, you do the math, that would say that even at 3% unemployment, we would typically have about 15,000 people unemployed. Okay, mm -hmm. so 15,000, 60,000. But then every month since then, we have seen this the unemployment number come down. And to the point now we're at about, I think the last number we saw for um, Omaha region was September's number, and that was about 3.8%. That's about a couple of percentage, a tenth of a percentage point above what it was a year ago. 
So you look at that number and say, boy, that's great. We're, we're back to where we were. Well, the reality is that for some reason, our labor force numbers have continued to go up too. So we're actually closer to 530,000 than we are 500,000. And there's still about 13,000 more people unemployed today than there were a year ago. Mm -hmm. How so many more? 13,000. 13,000. So 15,000 would be the norm. So we're sitting probably around 25 to 28,000 people, right? That are unemployed still. Um, we, there was a study that recently was done that said Omaha has the lowest percentage of uh, small businesses that are still closed due to COVID. Now this would have been an end of August number. And that number was 13% of our businesses were still closed. That doesn't sound too bad, 13,000, I mean, 13% of our businesses. Well, we have 25,000 businesses in this region. 13% of that is 3,250 uh, 3, companies have not reopened their doors yet. So while in relative terms, we're doing a lot better than we were in March, in April, in May, in June, in July, in August, we still have a ways to go. And I think if you marry the 13,000 number of, of more people unemployed than there were a year ago, and the 3,250 businesses that still haven't reopened, there's the problem. Because how many of the 3,250 businesses are gonna stay closed? Yes. So how many of those 13,000 don't have employers to go back to? Okay, so that, that's the first issue that we've gotta deal with. How do we get these 13,000 people back to being gainfully employed? A certain percentage of them will not change industry. They want to stay in the food industry. They want to stay in the event industry. You know, they want to be chefs. They want to be hostesses. They want to do all that. that there's nothing wrong with those occupations. That's what they want to do. And so they will try and figure out how to manage that, that tra the transition between um, when they are unemployed and when some business might, might be reopened again. But there is some percentage of those 13,000 that would like to be able to take advantage of maybe some job training, some upskilling, and get into some gainful employment that might make more and might make more at those jobs and potentially have better benefits. So how do we move those people into training so they have an opportunity to do better? But then there's this pool of people that we don't, can't quite put our arms around. And that's the folks that may have gotten laid off from a full-time job and are now working part-time jobs to, to try and put food on the table. And we don't know who those folks are. Um, it's kind of tough. There's no database that tracks that kind of data. But we do and, know and, that. And we, probably, and we don't know how many of them, right? That's right. So unemployment may be down here, but it may be down here only because Jane Doe and John Smith have gone from having one full-time job to having two or three part-time jobs. Or right in a household where one used to be the main breadwinner and their partner or spouse might not have, have had a job, now both of those folks might be working because the adult participation rate has stayed very, very high for us. It's still in the high 60s, low 70s, which is really an unusual number too. So there's, there's pieces of this that we don't yet understand. What we do know is that those two numbers, thousands more people being unemployed than, than were a year ago, and more than, more than 3,000 companies not being available to, for employment, those are things that we gotta keep in front of ourselves and make sure that we're working on those to try and turn that around in some way. Uh, two things, one, um, regarding the, the people who might be willing to take a left turn and do something differently in, in the challenge of, of identifying what that would be. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean and or MCC here in, into yeah. the equation. Yeah. And then number, and then the other, the other thing regarding the businesses that have not reopened, how much of that is indelible? I mean, is, is you have a feel indelible. How, how much of those 3,200 businesses, uh, how many of them probably won't open again? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so the first answer, you were right about MCC. Um, when the governor announced his stimulus package from the money he got from Washington and said, here's how I'm going to spend it. Um, a good chunk of it, 16 million, I think, was allocated for train, retraining and upskilling people who were unemployed due to COVID. And the method for that is $1,100 scholarships 
or grants to students to attend a community college in their region and to get upskilled between August and next May, at which time we need to make sure their employer is ready to hire them. So we actually are partnering with Metro Community College. Metro is obviously doing all the curriculum and all the training, and um, we are partnering with them to recruit businesses who will be the employers at the end of all that training. Sure. So the training path has to be consistent with the jobs that are going to be available at the other end. So all of that work is actually happening. And the last I saw it, we had um, 2,700 or 2,800 um, students who had qualified for the scholarships. And again, last time I saw it would have been a couple weeks ago, 1,700 or so had said, yep, I'm going to join go in that class. I'm going to use this scholarship and I'm going to come out trained at the other end. We think we need to get that number closer to four or 5,000 rather than the 2,700 or so that we have. And we think we got to have probably about 500 companies lined up to be employers at the end of it. I mean, how bad would it be if we get these individuals trained and there's nobody to hire them at the other end of the, of the spectrum? So that, that's our responsibility in this, in this upskilling, retraining kind of function that we're putting out for people. Part, part, thank you for interrupting, but, but yeah. it occurs to me that part of the part of this part of the conversation is um, that, that these folks need to choose wisely what they're training for, because uh, keeping yeah. in mind the, the the industries that have been hampered and, and 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 crippled in this thing. Right. Well, part of Metro's role in this is to help people make that that very assessment. So somebody will come in and say, "I want I got to do something other than what I'm doing." and being able to assess what their skills are, what their existing education might be, what their past experiences have been, and then putting them on a path to a job that, that accomplishes the goal you just talked about. So, you know, the community colleges across the state have a pretty significant responsibility here. Um, so much so that we realize that that, well, if you call that process a navigator process of some sort, you know, where you've got, mm -hmm. Um, somebody sitting down with a candidate and saying, let's look at where you can be successful. We think there's probably a need for an ongoing navigation process like that in the state in partnership with the community colleges and the business community so we can more rapidly help people figure out what their jobs need to be and what training that they need. And then how do we direct them to that training as we, as we can get it done? Um, the, the, the second part of your question is how how long lasting are some of these business closures? I mean, we've all seen, you know, some piece of it where we've had um, a favorite restaurant or a favorite retailer close their doors. And the notion is that they're closing them forever. You know, they're not just closing them for now. I mean, and we've all seen um, restaurants change hands and go into renovation. We've seen retailers that have been there a long, long time. They finally say, you know what, we're just gonna close. And then we've seen the national big boxes too that have made that same statement that nationally they've been impacted so much that they're closing brick and mortar stores. And so we've, we've seen all that too. So the likelihood of some of those coming back is probably slim. Um, but you know, we've seen that before in recessions. It never happened so quickly. It wasn't a matter of you know, one month they were here and the next month we had thousands of businesses closed like it has been in this time. But it isn't unusual during a recessionary period to see a larger number of businesses close and then over time businesses come back you know to fill in the void that that was left so you know we anticipate that that's going to happen too it seems crass but i just think the percentage of those folks that are just can close for six months or a year or whatever and then come right back again is kind of slim so we got to assume a good number of them are not going to be able to reopen and we've just got to be there to help create new ones and uh, make sure that there's resources there for those folks that want to step up, step up and open a business. Uh, the idea of creating new ones, the, the problem is that we're talking about brick and mortar here. And, you know, what, what you're feeling about, uh, about all of this happening at, at once, as you said, and, and now you've got brick and mortar that, you know, is brick and mortar and that's it. Yeah, you know, the real challenge with brick and mortar is that even when we all go back to work in our offices or at our campus, whatever it is, 
um, even that's going to be different um, because there will be a, still be a percentage of our coworkers that will still be working from home. They'll be they've figured out how to do remote work productively and all that stuff, and they'll stay there. And employers will probably encourage that too because it gives them some more diversity and they're a bit more uh, footloose to pivot when things if, if something like this ever happens again. Um, but they've also proven that they can be more productive in some ways too. Um, so the question is even in offices that I know we're, we are going to reoccupy the chamber offices at some point or another, you know, we'll get everybody back working out of those offices again. We'll still probably have some people that would prefer to stay at home, but even in our offices, we're going to use it differently. All that collaborative space that we created over the, when we rebuilt the space, kind of not going to need that anymore because the collaboration spaces is where challenges occur. So we'll be, you know, particularly if it comes to a pandemic like this. So we've, we've got to figure out us, like all other office owners or, or tenants, how they can use that space more effectively when we get our arms around this pandemic. Um, retailers have that same challenge. Um, how many retailers are, are now more visible on the web than they were prior to COVID-19? And maybe they some of them can do it really well without having brick and mortar locations but i suggest that we're going to have a number of them that will have um still want to come back and have a brick and mortar location of some sort so this is going to be a transition time here i think about how people use their space if 20 percent of the population stay working remote theoretically that saves 20% more space in your office building. But if we have to space people more generously than we were before, then that might make a difference for how we can take up that space again because we got people that are now working from the are not working in the office. So it's a it, it's unsettled, there's no doubt. But I I am not one of those folks that believe that 50% of the people will never come back to work in the offices that they'll always stay remote. I don't think the number is that high. The literature will tell you it probably isn't. I keep hearing 15 to 20%. I've heard as low as 10. I don't buy it going higher than 20 myself. But as my wife likes to say, I'm often wrong, but never in doubt. So, you know, there's a... <laughs> <laughs> There's, I could be wrong here, but you know, I, I think we're going to see some transition, but it's not going to be our gargantuan one that that you might predict. Yeah, I guess the, the challenge will be to the extent that that it occurs uh, indelibly, uh, repurposing mm -hmm. will be the challenge. Yep. Um, so, and, and you know, it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of interesting when you think about it. it it's kind of a, a knee jerk reaction to. The proposition that some of this continues as it is 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 that uh, that's a bad thing. But I mean, if economics uh, in the end show that we can be just as productive, it isn't it isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, and you know, it actually helps communities like ours that have a lot of redundant fiber in the ground and have pretty robust internet capability here in this community. It actually, gives us a bit of a competitive advantage. I mean, there are places not too far from where I'm sitting or where you're sitting where someone can't have this kind of a meeting without some kind of internet interruption, or they've had to do something truly extraordinary to figure out the technology to make it work. Not every community in the country has this level of service that we have. And so thank goodness we have it. Thank goodness we can do it. But I think it becomes the competitive advantage for us as well. And then if you think about the kind of community that we are, if people can, can work remotely, that means they can, they can be working in New York, but living in Omaha and doing their job remotely. So now we start worrying, thinking about quality of life. Well, I mean, do you want to live in New York or San Francisco or fill in the blank big city where it takes you an hour and a half to get into work and this, the public schools are terrible and taxes are ridiculously high and maybe crime is higher and cost of living is higher. What if instead of doing all that in New York, you decide to move to Omaha, Nebraska and take advantage of this technology and all the quality of life things that go along with it? You bet. So from both a business perspective and a talent perspective, that's a golden opportunity for us that we can take advantage of this notion of remote working and turn it into a market potential for us. 
I, I would I would suggest maybe there's a lot of that going on already, right? Or some of that's going on already. Yeah, just about every business leader I know has some anecdote of somebody that they know or somebody that knows their family that has moved a, somebody from one of the coasts um, and they're living here and doing their job wherever you know that job originated from. So there's there's a lot of that happening and I would suggest it's a golden opportunity for us moving forward. And the, the other opportunity for us is the notion that since we're in the middle of the country, that this reshoring of medical and pharmaceutical um, type of manufacturing um, can and should happen here just as, as much as it could anywhere else. And by being in the middle of the country, we can make it easier for people to distribute those goods everywhere they need to distribute them. So from a business type of perspective, we're also, we've already started a, a, a target group um, that's putting the materials together to attract those kinds of businesses here from offshore um, because we need to do that for our national security anyway. Yeah, I was looking for, at my notes here for that. I, I saw, I, I don't know what the terminology for that is, but you do, you, you have already begun to address that. Having, having talked about some of the realities of uh, how this has affected the Omaha area in terms of the, the, the retail picture, um, and, and people doing a large amount of purchasing online. Talk a little bit about the importance of, of doing that at locally as much as we can. <laughs> yeah, well, it is really you know? important. You're right. I mean, I think the last thing we want to do is, not, even though Amazon has some presence here and they just announced a big investment and all those kind of good things, the fact is that if we want to keep Omaha being what it is, we've got to be willing and able and intentional about doing business with businesses that employ people here, that pay taxes here, that have facilities here. And so, I mean, this whole notion of buy local is important. Buy local doesn't mean you only buy from a, a homegrown business, although that's a really good thing to do. And a lot of people, me included, like to do that and prefer to do that. Um, but every business that you see out there that is that you see driving by in your car uh, is a business that's paying taxes, that's employing people, that's paying the power bill, doing all those things, donating to charities and trying to keep people healthy. Um, and those people deserve our support too. So we need to be much more intentional about saying, even if I'm, I'm going to do it from my keyboard, I'm going to do it with a local business. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, we think that, you know, there's a dramatic impact on GDP just by having people do business locally. And, you know, we're actually in the business right now of trying to figure out what their retail leakage looks like, you know, how much retail sales have happened in this region over the past several months. And is there a way for us to tell how much of it has gone to um, local vendors versus external vendors? Um, don't know that we'll be able to find that out. But we can, we can do some math because right now, um, internet sales companies do have to pay sales tax in the state of Nebraska. And so we can at least look at, at, at when their payments come in, what kind of sales would that represent and how does that compare against sales a prior year and be able to see how much of it is done externally to larger retailers outside the market. So we are going to continue to encourage people um, not just during the holiday season, but particularly during the holiday season and then afterward um, to do business locally. Walk into the store, let your fingers do the walk-in via computer to, uh, to buy something from someone local, but be intentional about doing that because it'll make a difference to your friends and neighbors in your community. Let's, uh, I want to go through some notes I, I had uh, down okay. here to discuss because I know you'd like to touch on some of them. Uh, talk a little bit about what you're doing with this 2020 task force, the Thrive 2020 task force. Sure. So when COVID-19 hit, um, and then, of course, the social justice reform issues came to the table as well, um, we realized that we wanted to work with um, businesses to figure out a way that we could accelerate recovery that out of the recession that was caused particularly by um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we created six task forces, um, one on economic development, one on small business, one on workforce, um, one on diversity and equity, one on entrepreneurship, and one on public policy. 
And we asked them to come up with recommendations that we could implement this year yet that would help us accelerate towards um, recovery. And they've come up with some great stuff. So public policy was actually kind of simple. We need to pass some bills that were already in the process in the legislature. It wasn't simple getting it done, but it was simple to identify that we need to get them passed. And LB 1107 passed, which gave us the incentive bill we needed, gave us property tax relief, which we needed, and gave the, the, the um, University of Nebraska Med Center next project some state investment that will be matched by a couple billion dollars of other investment uh, in Midtown. So I mean, huge, really some big, pretty significant things. On economic development, it's really about the two things I've mentioned, or well, one thing I mentioned already, and that's reshoring. How do we engage um, getting some of those businesses back on this um, in America? And secondly, how do we build backlog? So a backlog for us is every month, we would, could anticipate somewhere between 15 and 18 new economic development clients uh, being added to our list. And then we would work those clients and then land a good number of them, hopefully. So 15 to 18 a month. By the time we got to June, that backlog was down, was, was we only generated six new projects. So we knew we had to do some more, some more aggressive marketing, some more aggressive outreach to try and generate more clients. The good news is by September, that number was up to 26. So 26 new prospects in September. October probably wasn't quite as robust as that, but we need to get to a point where we're back to filling the coffers so we have projects to land basically next year. In small business, buy local was a big thing. And so we continue to do some work on, on buy local. And then small business also had a supplier diversity initiative. So we can try and figure out a way to help more of our minority owned businesses and women owned businesses and veteran owned businesses do business with some of the larger businesses here in this market. Um, in workforce, it really got down to focusing on the unemployed. I mean, we talked about that already. How do we get those folks back to work? And then we realized there were some gaps in the system necessary to identify the data that we needed. So we're also working on how do we generate the data long term in that process. Diversity and equity had a whole host of things because in the midst of all of this, of course, uh, the civil rights issues came up um, after the, the death of George Floyd. And so there were a long list of things that came out of the diversity and, and equity piece that were covered in the We Will Pledge um, that 276 CEO signed that said, you know what, we think it's time um, to put racism and sexism to bed for good. And we're gonna be committed to making that happen. So there's a whole host of, of initiatives that came out of that one. In entrepreneurship, a good bit of it was just two of two pieces. One, in this kind of an economy, it is not unlikely for someone who's going to be let go from an executive position to get some kind of a severance package and look at that severance package and you know what? It might be the last time I'm going to have a big chunk of change in my hand like this. Maybe it's time I start my own business. So how do we make it easier for those people to access the ecosystem? And then secondly, how do we find people that are interested in being entrepreneurs? And so we created this pretty innovative approach and over a seven day period, I identified 420 individuals that said, you know what, I'm interested in being an entrepreneur. And now we're working with those folks to see if we can plug them into startups. So you can see that all of this stuff really was short term in nature. What do we have to do in order to make something happen pretty positive? And uh, I can't tell you how committed I am, how committed we are to making it happen and how impressed we've been with the volunteers and the staff and pulling these things together. Okay, uh, we're almost out of time here. You didn't get a chance to talk about a lot of things that I think you probably should have touched on. We'll do it next time. Um, let's just, I, I just want to throw it out to you in closing. What are, you, what, are you, what are your feelings about the near future and your vision for the near future and, and longer term? You know, I, I really think that Omaha is poised um, to respond better to this than a lot of other places. Um, we definitely gotta get our arms around this pandemic and we've gotta make sure that it doesn't overwhelm our healthcare services. So um, frank to anybody who's paying attention to this show, um, we're not through it yet. We still gotta protect ourselves and each other and our families and our friends and our employees. So be patient, don't be negligent, um, do what we need to do. Wear a mask, stay socially distanced and wash your hands and do it until this, this vaccine actually pops in and it gets widespread inoculations and we can 
get back to living life without worrying about the pandemic. But we, we can't we can't get to the next step until we've got our arms around this. So we gotta be patient. But I think we're we're poised to do better than a lot of other places are, Kent. And um, I think our diverse economy and our extraordinary leaders that we have in this community will um, will lead us out of this and we'll do a a remarkable job taking on the next challenges that happen after the pandemic. Yeah, they may be dramatic changes, but they don't necessarily have to be uh, terribly ne uh, negative in nature. And and uh, and so far, you know, we've done pretty well as a as a community and as a country in light of what's what's been we've had to wade through. Yeah, I mean, no one's ever done it before, so I think we've done well. Now, maybe history will point to us and say, well, you could have done this differently and done that differently, but when you're living in the midst of it, hindsight doesn't really matter. Um, it's, it's foresight that does, and so we've got to look forward and figure out what we can do, make the best judgments, and then go ahead and get it done. David, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. We'll do it again in, in another quarter. Thanks, Kent. Be safe. Thank you all for being with us on MCC TV. Our goal is to better acquaint you with the mission, the leadership, and the reach of the college. I'm Kent Pavelka along with David Brown for Metropolitan Community College.